if you're able to, to live graciously in a place, you are by definition humble <laughs> because you are constantly adjusting your behavior to what's happening in that environment and you're able to because you can read what's happening in that environment. You can read the signs of, of what has just happened and what is just about to happen. And uh, in order to do that, you have to sublimate your own ego. You, and then you are then, I think by definition, humble. Both writers and painters are creating works of the imagination that relate, uh, if they're really great, seem to be very realistic um, in, in that they seem to come out of the experience of living in the world. And they do that with very old-fashioned, minimal means. You know, writers just have words to put together. Uh, painters just have images and marks they make on a canvas. And out of this, you hopefully create a, a world that the, that the viewer or the reader can enter into imaginatively themselves and in a sense, complete the work w with the ex their own personal experiences they, they bring with them in there. Well, I think you're looking at an essence, the essence of the person. A great portrait always conveys to you some sort of sense of the essence of that person. I mean, sometimes it's not an essence that they, as the subject, like to see of themselves, but nevertheless, it's there. Well, when I stand in front of the, these works, I think it tells you something about each of these individuals that you wouldn't otherwise have known. And it also tells you something about how completely connected we are to our environments. And I think that's something that, that is not often seen in portraiture within the landscape context. You sort of see people against a background rather than people you know, integrated in some way in, in, into, into that background. And I think that's something that Mr. Hartman achieves in these paintings. Um, plus the other issue about them is, is their scale. Their scale is, is larger than life. And I think that is very important because it gives a certain monumentality and significance to these things. And it, it allows these people to be seen against these, this vast landscape. Well, he's an extraordinarily energetic and ambitious painter. He is very much an artist who rejoices in the, in the visceral kind of, you know, gutsy quality of paint. That's the frightening thing about being an artist is that you don't really know where the work's going. To keep the work fresh and to keep it strong, you have to walk into darkness. So if you look back throughout my career, uh, there is a, a common thing that, that I keep circling around in orbits, different orbits every time, which is this connection between people and place, the way that place influences people, which is, I think, an easy thing for us to understand, but also the way that people influence place. It's not so much the, the way that we physically change it, because that's obvious, but the, the, least, the less obvious thing is how we change uh, the way the larger population sees and understands a place. Well, I grew up in Georgian Bay. Uh, I always wanted to paint it. It had been painted extensively by the Group of Seven and a couple of generations of uh, uh, artists that followed them. And 
it had a huge influence by the 1970s on how people saw and understood what Georgian Bay looked like. And I think many people, when they get up on the bay, don't see the cottages, don't see the boats, don't see the small towns that are the service towns that allow people to go out to the outer islands. They see the rocky shoreline, the bent pine tree, and the big fall storm as it was kind of codified by Arthur Lismer and, and Fred Varley. And that this is most often done in, uh, in the first instance by creative people, uh, artists, writers, scientists, who uh, change our understanding of, of what a place is. The portraits aren't particularly flattering, and John has talked about this. It's not that this was absolutely intentional, but it certainly was not his intention to make them flattering. And I think that that's the way that writers approach people. And so I know that a few of the writers were a bit taken aback by, by John's view of what they looked like, but I was struck with the fact that that's what we all do. We all look at people and write about them, and we write about them as we see them. Whether they're real characters or whether they're fictional characters, they're as we see them. That's what the portrait is, and that's what John has done. It's not the way I see myself. I find that really interesting. You know, the colors are so rich and thick and the, everything's very um, uh, kind of in your face with this painting. Um, and also immediately I could recognize Hamilton. I could, I said, oh, I know that street, I know that street, I know where that is. There's my parents' house, there's this, everything was familiar in a certain way. I went to the gallery finally the day before the show closed and I was shocked by how big the painting is. I had no idea it was that big, so I was kind of standing there a bit gobsmacked by it. And uh, Nicholas Mativier came up and stood beside me, and for lack of anything else to say, I said, I think I could write something about this. And, and he said, oh, okay. He sort of called my bluff and said, uh, we'll send it over to your house. And so two days later, it was installed here, and it's been here for four and a half, for four and a half years. Almost immediately, I realized that it was a kind of portal to memory. I write in the mornings. I'd come in with a cup of coffee and I'd sit down and I'd look at the painting. And to my surprise, it started opening up all kinds of memories that I had forgotten I had. <laughs> 
What, what I thought was originally going to be maybe a magazine article grew and grew and grew, and it became a book called Likeness, for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, but Likeness seemed to work because I w became fascinated with the whole idea of what a portrait is. Um, in many ways, it, it's an approximation. John can't get at the essence of me any more than I can get at the essence of a character I'm writing about. So we all have these kind of approximations of one another that we, that we work with. Well, I suppose there must be writers who aren't particularly attached to a landscape, but honestly, I can't think of many. I think because landscapes contain memory for us, for everyone, but maybe particularly for writers. I've always been drawn to the coast. It's a magical place where two worlds meet, land and water. And there's no better spot on Canada's west coast than the area around Tofino. Wet and gloomy, even on sunny days, the fog is never far away. In this part of the world, it's always light jacket and heavy shirt weather and rain. Land's Edge on the Western Ocean is a haven for rain. When I'm feeling strong and invincible, I go to the prairies and stand in the sun. The land between Waterton and Lethbridge is spectacular but it is not for the meek. It's a bright anvil that stretches out forever under a hammered sky. Whereas a coast is a lonely refuge, a soft blanket, a gentle lover. The coast, a magical place where two worlds meet. Of the 12 lighthouse keepers, one stands out, Amelia Beavis, the sole woman. At his sudden death, she took over, slipping into the silence of his duties as into a just abandoned bed, the warmth still there. So many lives mark this place. When we went down to the Oliver Theatre on a Saturday afternoon to see a Western in color, we saw the same landscape we would see the next day when we went for a hike in the hills. We boys took our shirts off when school let us out in late June, and we didn't put them back on till they made us return in September. All taught by Hélène Dick, whom I secretly loved, and who allowed four of her grade 11 students to build a raft and float down the Red River and report about it, rather than write an essay on Huck Finn. It was late October, and at night there was frost, Mrs. Dick wrote me a letter after I published my first book and said that she did not recognize the student who had become the writer. Somewhere behind my head is the house on the south side road that my wife Holly and I bought 12 years ago, next door to the pink house where Michael Winter spends his summers. Even as a kid, Western Bay seemed like a place apart to me, a little adjacent to my regular life, next door to the modern world. Like the characters who live there, my Elliston only somewhat resembles the reality that inspired it. I suppose I can sit with that guilt a while yet, of writing fiction inspired by family, trying on their skeletons and making them other. An othered life is better than disappearing, right? These are the lies I tell myself. An art career is maybe not a linear thing going from here to an end, but a series of elliptical orbits around something, every orbit being slightly different, but you're still 
going around something. And I think the something for me is uh, this idea of connecting people in place. How can that idea drive everything you make? Because you never get it quite 100% right. That there's always something more to do. There's another way of coming at it.